So I'm going to be discussing the question of whether numerical cognition can tell us anything about this enduring debate that was hopefully introduced uh, about the question of whether mathematical entities exist in some realist sense in particular. So in the literature, in metaethics, which is basically the study of ethical systems uh, at a meta level, questions about, uh, you know, do, do morals exist? Would it be wrong to have slaves, for example, even if everybody thought it was right? That sort of questions. So in these discussions, people have wondered whether evolutionary explanations of morality do anything to uh, have a result in that, those debates. Do what ex to what extent do evolved origins of ethical beliefs, for example, when I believe pain is wrong? And of course, the reason that I believe pain is wrong has to do with the fact that people who believe pain is great, I mean, are not going to survive quite as well as people who believe pain is wrong. So to what extent do evolved origins of such beliefs give us a reason to believe that they exist in a realist sense? Now, many people have argued, such as Sharon Street, influentially, that in fact the evolutionary origins of ethical beliefs gives us reason to doubt that they actually exist in a realist sense. And then the debate has spread about mathematics. So what about mathematics? So if there's an evolved origin for believing, for example, that 1 plus 1 is 2, does that mean that this is true in some realist sense? Now, some authors, such as Walter Sinnott Armstrong, and um, uh, Richard Joyce have argued that prima facie, the evolutionary origins support mathematical realism. I'm going to go into all of this in much greater detail in a moment. I'm just now flashing out the debate. So Joyce says the following. People have these evolved capacities, for example, to believe that one plus one is true. And that implies that it is, in fact, true. Because we can have just no grasp, he writes, of how this belief may have enhanced reproductive fitness independent of assuming its truth. So he says there's just no story we can tell where 1 plus 1 is really false in some realist sense, or there is no 1 plus 1 is 2, and we would still have that belief. However, influentially, Justin Clark Doon wrote a paper where he argued that if evolutionary debunking arguments against realism work, in the ethical domain, then they also work in the mathematical domain. So he says, if you believe that, if there's good reasons to assume that uh, the evolutionary origins of our ethical beliefs give us reason to suspect that there are no ethical beliefs in a realist sense, or that we will never know them, well, he says, that just also works for mathematical realism. And I'll look at that in a moment uh, as well, so just to lay out the debate. So in this presentation, I will ask, okay, we actually know a great deal about numerical cognition. What do the data say? Do they support this debate in any way? Um, and the nice thing is that numerical cognition is one of the best studied forms of higher cognition in animals. It's extremely well studied. So we actually can look at it and we can look at whether it supports realism or anti-realism in the philosophy of mathematics. So there is this debate in philosophy of mathematics, whether such entities like the number two, or the number pi, or a completely random rational number I can just put there, exist in any realist sense. And realists say that numbers exist independently of our beliefs, independently of our cultural constructs. They exist in some sense independently from human thinking, whereas anti-realists, also called nominalists, think that numbers are handy labels that do not exist independently. That's why they're called nominalists, because nominalism, well, means about names. So they think they're just handy labels that we just use to denote things. I mean, there's, for instance, two microphones here. Um, two microphones. I call them two microphones. Very handy, but there is, no, there is no number two. It just doesn't exist independently. So, for example, suppose that you, and I really forgot the philosopher of mathematics who gave this great example, realist, who said, 70 million years ago, you walk the plains. Well, you don't, of course, because there's no human 70 million years, years ago. And there's two dinosaurs. One dinosaur meets another dinosaur. Do you think there's two dinosaurs now? 
If you do, then you're a realist. Now, just to see how many realists there are in this room. Okay, 70 million years ago, one dinosaur meets another dinosaur. There are two dinosaurs. Who would agree with that statement? Oh, that's pretty nice. <laughs> okay. Now, here's the evolutionary challenge. Uh, and I'm just sort of put it in a premise form. Uh, because actually this is this challenge that Clark Doan raises, but lots of evolutionary debunking arguments have this shape. We have an evolved propensity be to believe that P, and P is a belief about abstract objects in a domain D, because that belief confirmed an adaptive advantage to our ancestors. Even if it were the case that not P in some realist sense, it would still have been more adaptively advantageous to believe that P, so, no matter what the truth of P, we would have believed it regardless. Therefore, our belief that P doesn't drag a mind-independent property of abstract objects in domain D. So, just taking the ethical case, suppose that I believe pain is bad. And I believe that because my ancestors, by believing this, had a fitness advantage, and that's why we have this propensity to think pain is bad. Now suppose that there is some sort of moral realist world out there where actually pain is good. But even if that were so, we would still, through evolution, believe that pain is bad. Therefore, the belief that pain is bad doesn't actually track a mind-independent property because no matter what the realist world would be, we would still have the same beliefs, insensitive to the state of affairs. And Justin Clark Doan has a similar argument for mathematical objects. So he has this following uh, thought experiment. Um, and the thought experiment is as follows. There are two lines. There is a line behind one bush, and there is a line behind another bush. And so you have those two ancestors, and they see those lines going behind those bushes. One of the ancestors think ancestor P, one plus one equals two, and he runs away. The other ancestor thinks, hmm, one plus one equals zero and he just stays and he gets eaten. So, <laughs> you'd say prima facie, there's a good reason for believing one plus one equals two. It's fitness enhancing. However, Clark Doan has this weird trick at this point. He says, well, one plus one equals two talks about numbers and realistically construed, Platonists, well, that's one of the predominant forms of realism, believe that numbers are these sort of entities that are a-causal, outside of space-time. So, even if 1 plus 1 equals 0, per impossibile, but suppose that that was really the case, well, it would still be more adaptive to believe 1 plus 1 equals 2, even though that's wrong at this point, because you still have the same sort of first-order logical properties of the environment would be the same. Therefore, says Clark Doan, even if 1 plus 1 equals 0, we'd still believe that 1 plus 1 equals 2. So he has this evolutionary argument against mathematical realism, because no matter what the mathematical world would say, uh, we would still have the same beliefs. So there's the same sort of insensitivity to the realist world. This is, in a nutshell, the argument of Clark Doan. And it got lots of attention, this paper. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea to look at this paper in more detail. Now, what I will do is I will basically look at this argument, and I'll just show it again. Um, okay, so I'll first look at premise one. Is premise one of the argument true? Do we indeed have an evolved propensity to believe in all sorts of mathematical statements? And I'll argue in the affirmative that yes, we do have. But then I'm going to look at premise two, even if it were the case that, you know, the mathematical truths were different, would we then still have the same beliefs or would we have different beliefs? I'll look at that question as well, and I'll argue that premise two is actually false. And I should have thought of that, that these lines and trees are always going to come up. Um, so then I'll examine premise two. I'll find no support for premise two. Therefore, Clark Doan's argument fails, and that's basically my... A critical part of the discussion and I'll then also briefly say about how could mathematical realism be true then and you still have all this evolutionary stuff how could it be so 
I'll first look at the evolved capacity to represent numerosities. So brief um, distinction, and uh, Dirk, who is in the audience, we had this paper together where we made this distinction very clear. You have to make a distinction between numerosities and numbers. Numerosities are mental representations of magnitudes, and numbers are the abstract entities that are studied by mathematicians and philosophers of mathematics. So when students of numerical cognition in animals look at numerosities, then they look at that sort of thing, the mental representations. So this is going to, I'm going to be really quite quick here because this is going to be done in more detail in the next presentation, right? So animals have an evolved ability to distinguish between collections of one, two, three, and sometimes four objects. Uh, so, for example, there's cool experiments where um, newborn chicks, which have just been hatched, are imprinted. So you can imprint a chicken upon another chicken, which is what usually happens. But you can imprint them on anything. Like, for example, surprise egg insides. These are, I think, what they are. And, you, and it turns out that these chicks will preferentially follow you know, the numerosity that they've been imprinted upon. So two versus three, for example. So they see the difference between two and three. Even insects, such as bees, uh, have been found to have this ability. Amphibians, mammals, newborns. So even without any prior experience, animals can track the difference between one, two, three. Then larger magnitudes are represented approximately, and like in the previous presentation, I put some you know, not quite professional um, Collections of dots, so you can see the difference between these two. You can see which has more dots, right? The lighter or the darker ones. You can see that even without having to count it. That's your approximate number system, which is your other number system, which tracks approximate uh, quantities and it follows, but that's sort of like technical, the Weber Fechner signature, which means that the higher the numbers go, the more difficult they are to distinguish. So you can still distinguish six from eight, but you know, 68 versus 80, even though it's the same absolute difference, is very difficult to distinguish. I mean, it's impossible to distinguish uh, for a large majority of people. Now, do animals use these numbers in ecological contexts, which is one way to see whether they are evolved? And there has been this debate, so, so in the 1980s, um, behavioral biologists thought that this was sort of like the last thing that animals paid attention to when everything else fails, then you take numerical cognition. But in fact, it turns out that they use numerosities in a wide range of ecological decisions. So, for example, foraging. This is a cool study with red-backed salamanders who can choose between tubes where there's two flies or three flies. And it's a cool experiment because salamanders, like frogs, they only see things that move. So they can distinguish these differing different numerosities, even though it's just like little dots that move. Mosquito fish. So basically, when you have uh, the red-backed salamander and you give them the two tubes, then they'll choose the tube with a larger number of flies. And this is a cool experiment that I'm going to come back to, where animals also use numbers to think about intergroup conflicts. So chimpanzees, for example, have sometimes intergroup conflicts, and lions especially. So female lions, they defend their territory against intruders, and they roar to keep track of who is where. So they recognize the individual roars. And this is an experiment where a tape recorder was playing either one roaring individual that they didn't know, or three roaring individuals that they didn't know. And here you can see the probability of approach given how many members of the pride are in the vicinity. Now, as you can see, when there's only one intruder, that that probability goes up, you know, when there's already two individuals, about 40%. Uh, so the more lionesses are there, the more willing individual lionesses are to approach tapes. So they use this to assess is it going to work if we approach them? Are we going to win this intergroup contest? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So, um, it seems that, that all the examples you, you've shown so far uh, could also be explained by simply having a representation for more, so for a comparison, rather than actually a representation of numbers as such. Yeah, I'm going to come to that. So, yeah, yeah, so this, is, this doesn't at all explain that they're doing, that they're tracking numbers per se. So this is, 
And of course, given that these are naturalistic experiments, or as naturalistic as you can get foraging into group, there isn't that great a control for size and density as in some of the more controlled laboratory experiments. But it's just uh, to show that they use numerosities uh, in a wide range of situations. So for example, clutch size selection. So these are wood ducks, and wood ducks like to brood on nests uh, along the riverbank, but they also like to lay eggs in others, the nests of other wood ducks, which is like a very strange and stable strategy, sort of like cuckoos, but except that they have nests themselves. And sometimes you've got these nests like with 40 eggs and that sort of thing in it, and then they try to brood them out, it doesn't work that well. And in experimental situations, it's been found that wood ducks like to lay their eggs in nests that are not their own nests with a smaller clutch. So they prefer, for example, if you have 10 versus 5, they prefer the smaller clutch because presumably the smaller the clutch, the greater individual care their, you know, uh, their particular offspring receives at that host nest. So there's neural correlates for mathematical cognition. I'm not going to go into that in great detail. So there's been studies showing that this is really important, although not the only area that has been identified, but one of the areas, the bilateral intraparietal sulci in humans and in monkeys. And you see this lighting up when people do calculations with symbolic entities, when they try to estimate clouds of dots and so on. And there is a correlation between this sort of approximate and subitizing numerical skills and actual mathematical achievement because you can wonder, okay, you have on the one hand these sort of evolved capacities to deal with quantities and on the other hand you've got formal mathematics and how do the two relate to each other? So that's almost like a topic for a different talk, so I'm not going to go into that too much except to say that several studies do show that, um, for example, children who are better at or faster at saying, okay, the dark dots or the light ones, which of them are more, they also tend to have better uh, scores um, on mathematics at school if you control for other variables. So it does seem that we're using this, this stuff, uh, this evolved numerical cognition in our formal mathematical work as well. There's also structural differences, although I'm not an expert in looking at MRI uh, scans. So here you have the superior temporal sulcus and intraparietal sulcus. And you can see that people who have developmental dyscalculia, so who have difficulties with uh, uh, numerosities, that uh, there are structural differences in how the, uh, the intraparietal sulcus is um, organized. But does this support realism or anti-realism? Well, we can't really be sure because as a helpful member of the audience pointed out, we haven't quite made the connection between numerosities and numbers, so how do we do that? So that's why I'm going to look just a little bit more detail at the system, at how exactly numerical cognition is organized, and I'm going to go quite quick because next talk will go into more detail about these things. So there's Basically, several, several ideas about how numerical cognition works, but one of the dominant models is called the two-system account of number, which basically says that small quantities are handled by, and there are several terms for this, the object file system, and that uh, larger numbers are dealt with the approximate number system. So object files, uh, Carey, Susan Carey has this, uh, has this proposal, so she says, Okay, when you, for example, you have two apples, it's, well, no, there's not two apples, you have an apple and a pear, and you see these two objects, and you say, well, two, and basically what you're representing is there is an object, and there's another object that isn't identical to that object, um, and that's how you keep them in uh, mind. The approximate magnitude system is, um, actually, there's lots and lots of different models out there about how exactly it works, so I'm just going to talk about one model, namely the Han and Changeu. And I think the reason that this model is interesting um, is that it accords quite well with uh, empirical observations. So basically what they say is the following. First, 
You've got perceptual input. For example, this collection of geometric figures. And then your brain converts that once you've got past the early visual processing in what they call a location map. And so that means that all these different objects of different sizes are just sort of reduced to individual sort of representations or locations on a map. Then they are put into a summation cluster where this is all put together as an analogous quantity. And then finally, a numerosity cluster, which are neurons that fire preferentially at certain quantities. But they don't do it like you don't have a number, a neuron that exactly fires at five, but it fires at something like distributed around five. And there's been studies with rhesus monkeys that actually show that this is the case. So when they, rhesus monkeys are trained to uh, look at different displays with numbers of dots, and they're controlled <coughs> for size, then they will, for example, optimally fire at five, but also around that distribution. And they propose a logarithmic spacing uh, where as you increase, you have fewer and fewer neurons allocated per numerosity. But what does numerosity track? So now we've got good empirical support for an evolved capacity for something like numerical cognition, but we still haven't clarified how numerosities and numbers relate. Because recall what Clark Doan says, numbers are these sort of platonic entities. We don't have any connection with them, even if it were the case that 1 plus 1 equals 0. We would still believe that 1 plus 1 equals 2. So how do these relate? How do numbers and numerosities relate? I think that the main problem with Clark Doan's interpretation, uh, with his argument, is that he just doesn't say how it works. He doesn't say how these ancestors in that scenario that he depicts, and actually I've sort of given you the whole of his argument, he has these ancestors and they have these beliefs, how exactly do the, does this correspondence between the first order properties of the environment, lines behind bushes, and cognition achieved? Well, you can look at evolved features of numerical cognition, and we will do that now, and look at the theoretical framework of these two systems of number to actually get an idea about how that works. Now, the object file system could do it. Object file system actually doesn't represent numbers. There's no numbers in the object file system. You can just write it out in this logical notation as you've just seen. And you don't need any numbers. It looks at uh, objects in the environment which are sort of put in memory slots. And that explains subitizing, but it doesn't explain approximate numerical cognition. So, in uh, Clark Dunn's scenario, indeed it could be the case that the ancestors uh, have beliefs about lines based on these object files, but suppose our ancestors go and they have to forage one of these trees, they have to choose which tree to pick, and they would choose, and there's lots of empirical work showing that they would indeed go and choose that tree on the left, how do they do it? Well, they can't do this thing like there's an apple and there's another apple and there's yet another apple and there's yet another apple and this one has one apple and then yet another apple because you just lose track. So then you use the approximate number system. And the approximate number system does make reference to numbers. So if you look at the models uh, of, for instance, the Han and Changeu and other models, they do seem to refer to numbers. And I think it's important to let our ontological claims be led by scientific practice. And actually, that project has already been started by Quine. So when Quine gave his indispensability argument, he said, so Quine said, basically, mathematical objects exist because scientists invoke mathematical objects. They invoke real numbers, for example, and they invoke things like electrons. Now, if you believe on the basis of what they say that electrons exist, then you shouldn't be discriminatory and also believe, by the same token, that the mathematical entities exist. So you could, of course, I mean, we could, I'm not going to go into a long debate about the fruitfulness of such an approach, but if you think it's sensible to let your ontological claims be led by what scientists say, then it does seem that scientists have a crucial explanatory role for numbers in their research of numerical cognition. They do their very best to single out numbers uh, 
rather than say visual density or total surface area, they really try their hardest in all sorts of experiments to control for that. So, for example, Cantlon and colleagues looked at the response in the bilateral intraparietal sulci in children and adults, and they looked, they controlled for things like changes in shape, uh, changes in size, changes in density area, and they said, look, the thing that the children and the adult's brain responds to is changes in number. So it does seem that if you look scientific practice, they do have a crucial explanatory role for numbers. And similarly, uh, Dada et al.'s experiment that looked at natural experiments for shoal size transference, so they looked at, so guppies basically like shoals that are larger, like all shoaling fish like shoals that are larger, because in a larger shoal, there's less of a chance you get eaten, since the predator will just be satisfied with the same sort of amount of food, so the larger the shoal, the safer you are. And they found that uh, these guppies and mosquito fish, or I think this was mosquito fish, um, at some point they even showed them in a tank such that you could only see the fish one by one, and even then the effect was there. And they did that to control, to make sure that controlling for visual density, social, so total surface area. Now, if you look at, uh, so I think prima facie, scientific practice supports a realist interpretation for numerical cognition. However, cognitive scientists also use fictional entities, like for example, the Changeux and the Hanna model has location maps in the brain. And they don't for a moment really believe that there are maps in the brain, it's sort of like more like a metaphor. And this indeed is something that Penelope Maddy says, you know, you have models that consist regularly of real entities or things that people assume are real, such as electrons, and fictional entities such as frictionless slopes. So if you have a model that has real things and fictional things, if the model is confirmed, it doesn't license belief in all its theoretical posits. So that's a problem. How do we know that a mathematical object, so this is going back to the indispensability argument, how do we know that it's really doing any explanatory work, that it really has to be existing in some realist sense? Now, Baker, Alan Baker, I think is his name, has this updated version. So he has this, um, he has this argument that mathematical entities can play a crucial explanatory role. And he gives us an example, the Magisicada life cycle. And uh, Magisicada are several species, and I suppose they're in Canada too, but I'm not very sure. They're somewhere in the US at any rate. They're insects, and they spend a lot of time under the ground, something like 13 years or 17 years. And then they come out of the ground, and they have this brief stage where they fly about, and then after they mate, they eat, they die. So it's very interesting that these are 13 and 17 years. Like, I mean, there's like eight different species. So it's, it's, it's too good to be a coincidence. Well. People who have studied magisicadas actually say that the primeness of the life cycles has an adaptive advantage. There's, there's two advantages, actually. One is those magisicadas come in big masses. So there's an enormous like, outbreak of magisicadas. And if you had predators that ate them and could tune their life cycles to the magisicadas, that wouldn't be very good for them. So by having a life cycle of 13, you're not going to be intersecting with other animals' life cycles, except animals with a life cycle of 1 or a life cycle of 13. That's the nice thing about having a prime life cycle. Secondly, magisicadas are related species, but still they can't meet with each other and produce fertile offspring. So there is the worry that if you do waste that really short, precious time that you meet on partners that are incompatible, that's not good. So, magisicadas also avoid having, you know, the confusion of closely related species that they would mate with. So, they also avoid having life cycles with each other. They also avoid competition with each other in that way. So, it's all great. The primeness of life cycles provides indispensable mathematical explanation of a purely physical phenomenon, says Baker. So, that's how he argues that. Um, so, this is a a way out of these problems with the traditional indispensability argument.
And there's been a lot of recent literature about this example, about whether it's really... And at some point, you know, Alan Baker says, I don't know, I mean, <laughs> at some point it's just something either you accept it or you don't. Um, there's also the question about, isn't it weird that an A causal, I mean like the primeness of 13, that's not a, something that causes anything, it's not that you say, oh, I broke my leg because 13 is prime. You know, how can that happen? <laughs> well, Lyon has this idea that mathematical explanations can work as parts of process exp program explanations. So you have process explanations, which are these really like low-level explanations, and then you've got program explanations, which are sort of like more high-level. For example, that a square peg doesn't fit in a round hole, for example. And he argues that the primeness of the life cycles contributes to program explanations of the length of the Marcus Cicada life. Even though 13 doesn't really cause anything, it still plays a role in this sort of high-level explanation. And I think, in fact, that you could use the same argument to look at how animals behave in uh, numerical situations. So, for example, if you have foraging decisions, you could have all those individual foraging decisions where the salamanders go for the larger quantity, for example, to just say, well, the numerical system is able to discriminate between these two numerosities. And similarly, the lionesses' behavior, so the way that this is plotted out, you could just say that they know how many animals there are in their group, approximately. They hear how many animals there are. Say something like seven is larger than three, and that provides a good program explanation for why the individual lionesses behave in this way. So I think that does give you explanatory potential. And the same with the shoaling fish experiment. So you have all these different fish, and they do prefer shoals of eight fish over shoals of four fish. And the reason they do so well is because eight is larger than four, and you can then have also the explanation that it's good to be in a shoal that's larger rather than smaller because of predation risk. But you see how the eight is larger than four plays a part in this high-level explanation. Now, I'm just going to briefly flesh out a realist account, because there is still this problem. How do these numbers that are a-causal, how do they exactly, how do we learn about them? Because I haven't explained that. How do animals learn about that? That is the so-called access problem. Benazirov has this question. Mathematicians are made of flesh and blood. Mathematical entities are these a-causal platonic things, abstract. How do we learn about abstract objects? We're situated in space-time. This is an enduring question. There is one answer, there are several answers to this question, because the uh, Benazir question was a much discussed question in philosophy of mathematics, and it still is. Shapiro has an idea, so he has the anti-ram anti -ram structuralism, um, and he says the following. So basically, you have to think of numbers as positions in a structure. The problem arises with the access problem if you think of numbers as isolated objects, such as cats and fridges. I mean, if you have a platonic cat or a platonic fridge, you can't possibly learn about it without interacting with it. But if numbers are positions in a structure, then we don't need to interact directly with them. It is just sufficient if we are, keep on getting instances of this same structure. So for anti-RAM structuralists, Numbers are a bit like, for example, take in a football team. In a football team, you have all these different roles. You have, for example, the role of the goalkeeper. It doesn't matter how tall the goalkeeper is. It doesn't matter what his hair color is. So you don't have to worry about what the number two is, for example. The only thing you have to know is how does it function in the natural number structure. And the question to be solved then for naturalistic philosophers of mathematics is how do we learn these structures or patterns? Shapiro has an answer to this. So he writes the following. Our child starts to learn about cardinal structure by ostensive definition. The parent points to a group of four objects, says four, then points to a group of four objects and repeats the exercise. Eventually, the child learns to recognize the pattern itself. Now, it turns out that that's not quite as simple. Um, 
In fact, there are, so this is sort of the account that Sonica proposes and that Carey and lots of other developmental psychologists propose that actually happens. What happens is first children learn count English just as meaningless. So they say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And if you ask them to give a number of objects, they'll just give you a random number of objects. Then they, probably using their object file system, learn to become, they become one knower. So if you say, give me one cookie, they give you one cookie. If you say give them two cookies, they just still go at random. Then they become two knowers, where they learn how to give two correctly. Then they become three knowers, and you would think, okay, it goes on like that, four knowers. But then, after three, they make a crucial inductive step, where a child notices the analogy with next in the numeral list and next in the series. And the child realizes that for the small numerosities, is X is followed by Y in the counting sequence. Adding an individual to a set with the cardinal value X results in a set with cardinal value y. And that generalization is what is called uh, the successor function. And of course, object files do help to build this up, but I think that approximate magnitudes are still important for us to gain semantic access to larger magnitudes. So it does suggest that if you see how people count and what they do that evolved numerical recognition plays a crucial role in the representation of numbers. So I'll just conclude. There is an enduring tension in realism about abject objects and on the, on the other hand evolutionary accounts of human cognition. How can our minds represent objects that are abstract that we don't interact with? And some people like Clark Doon think that actually um, on the basis of numerical cognition, we can conclude that realism about mathematical objects is false. But I argue that prima facie research in numerical cognition favors a realist interpretation. And the reason for that is simply that the researchers themselves ap appeal to numerical entities. His idea of first order logical situations doesn't explain how we have approximate numerical cognition. And I've proposed anti-REM structuralism as one way in which that could work. I think there are other ways in which you could flesh it out. But it's just to show that there is not a problem with a, there's no issue with the access problem and basically realists are in pretty good shape um, given all we know about numerical cognition. So there's a challenge to the anti-realist. I'm not saying that we now have a decisive case. After lots and lots of of discussion, Platonism is finally vindicated. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that anti-realists should have an explanation as well about how do evolved features of numerical cognition work using an anti-realist framework. And um, it would be interesting to see how that would work. I'm not saying that it wouldn't work, but they should do it. Okay, thank you.